Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. What has been your past involvement with either? It's a little difficult to understand. It says, by an ashram education questionnaire. And then it's dealing with Varnashram and education is two different topics. Whereas if it's a Varnashram education questionnaire, then it should be one topic, education about Varnashram. So it's it's a little difficult to understand there. But it says here either of these topics, so it's talking about two topics. Pass involved with either of these topics. Well, education, uh, that's the specific reason for accepting sannyas, is to officially act as as an educator, as an instructor. Of course, what, what is meant here by education? Sannyas is meant for giving instruction by practice and precept. You know what this means, practice and precept? You all understand that? Precept means by telling, you do this. And practice means to personally do it and teach by personal example. So there's a saying in English, practice is better than precept. Better than telling someone do this is to yourself do it and set the example. Apani Atri Prabhu Jivere Shikai, it's stated about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that by his personal example he taught. So, uh, past involvement with education means one who takes sannyas is especially within the line coming from. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, that's especially meant for preaching. So, actually our whole life is meant for education. Generally when we speak, when we think of education, we think in terms of formal education. Just like you are students at the Srimad Bhagavatam Vidyapit. So this is considered the period of education, or going to school, this is considered education. But real education directs a person to become educated at every moment. Education doesn't, is not restricted to the classroom. And nor is it restricted to a certain period of life. Of course, there is a period of life in Vedic culture and in any civilization which is meant specifically meant for learning. That's the beginning of life. But not the, from childhood. Komara Acharya Pragyo Dharman Bhalavatanya From the young age one should start to learn. Not immediately from birth. Although it's said that the first guru is the mother, so she teaches in some way, preliminary. That's why I often say that gurus aren't meant for teaching. Traditionally they don't teach things like don't put your hand in your mouth except when you're eating or brushing your teeth. Don't yawn in some, without covering your Face. They're not, that's, the mother teaches all these things. But in the modern age, neither mothers nor gurus teach. They don't know. So education. What is my involvement with education? Total. But not, not officially in the manner that in education is generally thought of.
although I am definitely aware of the need for real education and I'm concerned with that which is why I've sent or encouraged several of my disciples to come here which is this place is meant for real education isn't it? What's that Prabhupada used to call Vidya Bhagavad Amit the limit of education is Srimad Bhagavad. Where's that from? Where's that quote from? Prabhupada used to call that sometime. I've seen that in Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvatakura's writings. Any of you know where that's from? No? You can find that out. Say, is this is Srimad Bhagavad Vidya Pit. You've heard that saying? You didn't hear that before? You can, you can look it up in the. You have it there, your folio. You looked it up? What's it? Vidya Bhagavata Abadi. Abadi means. Hmm. So, where's that quote from? You can. It's another point of research. That's point number 50 zillion. And one, something else to research. Yeah, um, anyway, we'll speak more about that then. Then with Van Ashram, also, my involvement, past involvement, what is your past involvement? What is your present involvement? Have you given seminars, talks, and collection? What is your present interest and involvement with these topics? With Varnashram, yeah, I'm very much aware of the need for that. I've spoken many times about this formally and informally. That my perception of the need for establishing Varnashram communities as Srila Prabhupada had envisaged land-based Varnashram communities is such that I feel that many of the problems that we are facing in ISKCON today and we all know that ISKCON is facing various problems on various levels, are uh, due to not having taken up the 50%, which Srila Prabhupada said, 50% of his work, which he had not done, which is establishing Varnashra. Now if we consider what Prabhupada did, which is impossible, it was so impossible that no one even dreamed of it. Markine Bhagavad Dharma, Krishna Conscious in America. <coughs> Prabhupada did it. He established Krishna Conscious in the Western countries. And then he, the other part of making Varnashram communities, it's such a, a big thing. But this, this completes the revolution. Without this, then we must fall back on the old culture. Just like I'm discussing in the last few days with Kishore Prabhu about his future. What to do? Now he's a married man. Generally one finishes student life and then gets married. But it's a mixed up society. It's, it's a society without any clear structure or shape or direction. This individualism means that there's no there's no shelter or guidance in a structured society. The education, the blacksmith's son is taught how to be a blacksmith. He has his social position. He doesn't have to cut a profile or follow the latest fashions. His position is fixed. That's his education. He learns how to make Horseshoes, for instance. That's what a blacksmith does. It's required in a, in a society where there are horses. That's called a farrier. Probably most English speaking people don't know that word anymore. You ever heard that word? Farrier means someone who puts horseshoes on a horse. It was required. 
It's not, not everyone can do it. You like to try putting horseshoes on a horse? Horse, unless you know how to do it, you're not going to be able to do it because it hurts the horse you to bang nails into its foot. So there's uh, you know, the the individuality in modern society is such that no one knows what they're doing, why they're doing, where they're going, what the purpose of life is, and everybody's crazy. More or less, the whole society is insane. So the necessity of our national society. Yeah, I was talking with Kishore, so I was saying that now what's he going to do? Now wife means. Atol griha kshetra sutapta vitaya. All these things are required. Stri, vistara, expansion. Once you get a wife, then griha is required. Land, children, and their social life, and vitta, money. All these things are required. So how to get? Then we're, we're discussing. And well, you can always become a lawyer. I get trained as a lawyer. But then, uh, then that means asat sangha. The very basic principle of Krishna consciousness is that asat sangha tiya vaishnavacha, giving up bad association. But due to lack of any other economic alternative, devotees are forced to associate with non-devotees, and then they lose their Krishna consciousness. And wor- or worse, maybe, they retain some level of Krishna consciousness, but they want to practice it on a template of modern humanistic thinking. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. Krishna conscious works on the basis of Guru Sadhu and Shastra, but by association, we accept, and this is where education comes in again. We accept ideas from people who do not know that there is any goal of life, let alone the means to attain it, and they think that the goal of life is. Eat, sleep, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we shall all be dead. And religion is just the only, they don't have any idea. Dharma sehyaya naruto thaya prakampati. What is the next line? I don't always speak. Narata sya dharma ikanta sya kama la bhaya vishvata. Dharma, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Generally people think Dharma, one follows Dharma and then one's desires will be fulfilled. By following Dharma, I will get Artha, Kama and Moksha. But Dharma is not meant for fulfilling material desires. One should desire to live simply for inquiring into the absolute truth, not simply for acquiring money. So bad association. So these Varnashram communities are required <coughs> for several reasons. One reason is so that we can practice Krishna consciousness in the association of devotees, have our own communities, our own culture. where we can live according to our own ideals. Our ideals means those given by Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. If we don't do that, then uh, we are forced to live to some, at least to some extent according to the ideals of non-devotees. And, like I say, as well, many of the ills of this scholar, I perceive that we haven't done. So I'm, whatever is my involvement, 
Well, you could say concern, I'm speaking about it, and at least some people have, uh, some devotees have based their life, or they've taken this up as the mission of their life, or they've accepted the the standards that I've told them and live their life according to that. At least one devotee went to the land that means outside Ahmedabad in Gujarat while Srila Prabhupada was present one gentleman from Bombay donated a large tract of land which Srila Prabhupada said to develop as a national community which hasn't hadn't been done. So now one devotee who says that he's inspired by my speaking about it has gone to try to develop that. In family life also, I regularly preach about the principles of family life. There is concern about this in the Western, in, in America, there's North American Grihasta Ministry or something like this. And they're concerned with the high rate of divorce in ISKCON. But I'm afraid that their approach, again we're talking about education, their approach is, although it is maybe well intentioned, it's going to, in the long run, it's just going to compound the problem because they discuss in terms of modern society's standards and expectations for family life. It's based on well, how the husband and wife, they put more emphasis on how they can, it's based on modern psychology in short, rather than being based on the dharma prescribed by Shastra and tradition. That you're, you're, do, you're married and now you just have to stay together. Like it or not like it. Adjustment. Uh, well one major adjustment which mostly people don't want to talk about nowadays is that, but which Srila Prabhupada spoke of so many times, is that the wife should be submissive to the husband. The husband should be a first class devotee. And they say, well, if the husband's not like Ram, I'm not going to be like Sita. That's the usual excuse. But the husband is, is never like Ram, but still it's the wife's duty to attempt to be like Sita. She, even if he doesn't follow his dharma, it's the wife's duty to follow hers. But instead of talking about duty, they, they talk about mutual compatibility. Basically, men and women are not mutually compatible anyway. So they say, they get the uh, astrological matching and they say 70% compatible but there's practically men and women they're not very compatible so when we say compatibility it's all relative so more important than trying to make some psychological adjustment which will never work it's based on a dream that they lived happily ever after you read the fairy stories. They were married and then they lived happily ever after. It's a fairy story. No one lives happily ever after. So, by, by bringing in this uh, modern psychology there, they're trying to make it so that people, are, husband and wife, are adjusted according to the adjustment which is dreamed of by people who don't have knowledge of the actual nature of human nature. So in this way they're, they're contributing to the problem. Better to live according to Dharma. It is possible under all circumstances. The sense of dharma, education. What is education? What did Prahlad say when Hiranyakashipu asked him? What's the answer? 
What's the best education? Tamange adhita uttama. What's the best? Shravanam, kirtanam, Vishnu smaranam, pada sevanam, arjanam, vandanam, dasyam, sakyam, avade vedanam, iti pungsarpita Vishnu, bhaktis chena bhavakshana. Vitya, what's the next line? Sorry. But this chain of action. Then I lost the third line. Tam manye adhita muttama. Tipam sarpitamish. This is the best education. So that's the best education. And for living in this material world, there is the sense of dharma. Now this is Tonavana Ashram, there's a, a major mistake which is made in our movement. It's the same mistake the Sahajiyas make. And it's been adopted by many devotees in our movement. Thinking that because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said about Varanashram, Eho Bhajya, this is external. That we have no use for Varanashram. It's the same thing the Sahajiya said. Bhaktivinoda mm-hmm. Thakur wanted to read, or well, he, he wanted to establish the importance of Varnashram in Vaishnav society because although Varnashram is external to the need of the soul, it is required for the conditioned soul. Varnashram is Varnashram Dharma gives a system and specific rules for living in this one in this world so that one does not live as an animal. Regulated life. Regulated life is required for spiritual advancement. There is the regula- there's the regulation of sadhana bhakti. And this sadhana bhakti of the sadhaka. Uh, there are many rules which are not mentioned in Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Angas, which are taken for granted. They are mentioned by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his teachings to Sanatana Goswami. Things like Danta Dhavana, brushing your teeth. So you may think, what's that got to do with Bhakti? But uh, all these activities are required. How to live in this world as a civilized person, civilized according to the Vedic understanding. Uh, that is required. It's not mentioned among the Bhaktiyamras, but that is these basic activities, rising early, taking bath, the culture of respect for seniors, the sanctity of marriage, worship of the cows, the Varnashram system, acting within Varna and Ashram, these are followed not only by Vaishnavas, but even by non-Vaishnavas. Mayavadis, Prabhupada said that up to the point of liberation, the philosophy is the same of Mayavadis and devotees. After that, there's a big difference. What is the nature of liberation? But the culture is the same. Their the understanding the Mayavadis are this is wrong, but the culture is the same. So this way of living, if we live like that, that is favorable for practicing bhakti. If we don't live like that and we think, well, it doesn't matter, I can marry and divorce five times, it doesn't, we don't have <coughs> even basic things like, you know, we see that devotees do all the basic things like they'll, they'll put their hands in their mouths and then they'll turn the pages of the Bhagavatam and 
so many basic things. I think probably in Indonesia, they, at least in the country, people follow all these things, is it? Yes. Still, probably. That the Indian culture is stronger there than it is in India. I can imagine. Although I've not been there. So, we may think this is not like we, we'll just do bhakti. And all these things, that's all external. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said it's all external. But if we don't follow these basic things, one thing, there won't be any stability in society. Uh, another thing is that bhakti, pure devotional service, is above Varnashram, that's true, beyond Varnashram, it's not below it. There's a difference. Not following Varnashram is for people who are above it and below it. So acting below it in the name of bhakti, that doesn't, by not following Varnashram, that does not help one to become devoted. Rather one, one should follow generic dharma. Everyone, we see, all, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he also, why did he take sannyas? And he observed, having taken sannyas, he observed the rules of sannyas very strictly. So, Bhakti Rav Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Sai Thakur, they wanted, of course, the Varnashram had become perverted in the caste system. So they wanted to establish what that is proper. So, Vana, we need our own communities, we need our own education system, we need our own culture. Srila Prabhupada once said that his disciples, they were not afraid of Maya enough, too complacent, not afraid of. So, we think we can just merge into modern society and still be devoted. And it doesn't matter. But it does matter. If, if we associate with a non-devotional society, then we pick up so many wrong ideas. We don't realize how sick and perverted modern society is. That's our fault. We don't realize that how by cultivating calm, crowd and low, which are the three gates to hell, the modern society is such a mess. Education, at the present time, within ISKCON, there's so much reverence for mundane education. But what is the result? Srila Prabhupada said that, not just Srila Prabhupada, but anyone can understand, even even 50 years ago in the Western world, it was understood that education is meant for, for producing character, people of character. It doesn't matter so much what, how, how much you learn or what is your character. Until recently, they used to teach Latin and Greek. And then people would read the, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey and all these things. In, the original Greek, and then they thought, and then Latin was there for for reading the Bible and uh, and conducting church services in Latin. Now we may say that and then they thought, what's the use? It's all let's teach something useful like biology, cutting up frogs. What's the use of this Latin and Greek? But the idea of teaching that is for imparting and teaching the classics. Of course, the Iliad and the Odyssey are really on the same level as Srimad Bhagavatam. But the idea was to impart character through education by hearing about the character of what they consider to be great people. So the idea was there. So we may be enamored by modern education, but what is the result? As Srila Prabhupada pointed out, they're turning out cats and dogs. They're teaching in the schools how to be cats and dogs. The, educa the education means 
One should learn sense. The beginning of education is to learn sense control. But just the opposite. They're teaching how to have sex at a very young age. And the education is simply how to get a certificate so that you can get a job and earn money so that you can eat, sleep, mate, all these things. How you become a big animal. People become very proud. I've got this degree. So then I can... The modern education means how to become a shudra. But in Vedic education means that education awards one's social independence. Independence, the Brahman is independent because by virtue of his knowledge he doesn't care for any luxury. Anashakta anabhishvanga putra dara griharadishu that is uh, aniketa stiramati he doesn't, if he doesn't have a house he's not disturbed he's not attached to anything so he doesn't need to run around kasmad bhajanti kamayo dhanadur madanda what does he need to go around flattering rich people he's satisfied whatever comes he can live by virtue of realized knowledge. He's not a he's not a slave of money or rich people. He's got something better. That's the knowledge, the knowledge that gives detachment from this material world. But modern education, far from making us detached from this material world, makes us more and more and more greedy to enjoy without understanding there's no enjoyment here whatsoever. So what what is the use of education which leads us completely in the wrong direction? So it is fascinating, yeah, I mean in modern age it's called the what's it, the information age. It's, it's, they've collected so much information on so many topics and is studying so many things. So it can be quite fascinating, the world of modern intellectualism. Srila Prabhupada wanted a book written called Intellectual Animalism. <laughs> that for all their intellectualism, they don't know what the goal of life is. So therefore they're living like animals. One devotee told me, who is that? I think it was Mahabodhi. Told me that they, they, when they first started this BBT library party for selling sets of Srila Prabhupada's books in the universities, <coughs> first of all in America and later on throughout the world. So in the beginning they thought, well, this is this is quite exciting. You know, we're going to meet, we're going to meet all these scholars of Indology and sociology, and we're going to meet, it's going to be different from distributing books on the street where it's just hi, how are you? Take a book and. We're going to be discussing with these highly educated and cultured people. But they found, but their actual experience was very disappointing. They found out that these professors, they're just all having sex with the uh, students, with the young girls. And one of the big, he told me one of the biggest professors, <laughs> one of the most famous names in Indology, he walked into his office, he was lying on his desk, completely drunk on midday. So they don't, they may like to discuss they may like to discuss but they're they're licking the honey bottle on the outside. Monday Akam editions means that they are sworn to irreverence, whereas real education teaches respect. Vidyada dati vinayam. Actually, it's supposed to. Education gives humility, but one cannot even begin to be educated unless there's humility. But from the beginning, in, in modern education, there's, there's no humility, no respect. And the, in modern education, the principle is asatyam apratishtam. Nothing is fixed. There's no absolute knowledge. We're just examining everything. 
Krishna and Krishna consciousness is a subject of study. Just like some people study frogs and some people study history and some people study Vaishnavas and Vaishnavism and Krishna. They give their different theories and they say, well, according to the Gorya Vaishnavas, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is an incarnation of Krishna. They can never write Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Chaitanya Krishna Jagati Paratattam Paramiya. They can't write. They can't accept this. They say, well, according to Rupa Goswami, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the most munificent incarnation. You know, quote, Namo Mahabharata. But it's all according to, according to. It's not really a fact, but that's what Rupa Goswami says. And they record, they'll get a PhD for writing it down. So they are sworn to undecidedness irreverence. They can never, it, it's part of the accommodations hmm, MO, modus operandi, that they can never be, they can never, of course they may show some token respect, but ultimately their respect is, is like a kind of imp- impersonal idea, well everything's everything's kind of alright. Whatever you are, all opinions are as good as any other. Multiculturalism is the modern fashion. So everything's is, so if you like to believe in that it's okay, but they can never they can never fully respect and they'll they'll point out their business is to point out flaws and discrepancies and contradictions. Srila Bhaktisiddhan Sasra Thakur made his magazine called The Harmonist. He spoke against harmony, the attempt to make harmony on the mundane platform. He said it's never possible. But real harmony means to be in line with Krishna's desires. And real harmony means that Acharyas, they understand the underlying principles of Shastra and the apparent contradictions which are there, which the mundane scholars love to point out, they understand the underlying harmony. Even between different acharyas who are supposed to be of the same sampradaya and they say different things, they understand the harmony because they understand the basic principles and they understand the purpose. So, Vedic education means surrender to Guru. That's the beginning. Then you can begin to learn. And the Guru, of course, he's supposed to be learned. He is Nishnata, he's immersed in Shastra knowledge. But that knowledge, the whole concept in modern society is knowledge is something that you acquire, it's all very logical, you put everything, this in this category, this in that category. Well, you may wonder why you're Srimad Bhagavatam, how can you learn about Srimad Bhagavatam? How can you study Srimad Bhagavatam when it appears to be so unstructured? It's, it's, it discusses something here and that's it. If you, if you want to learn about, for instance, how a disciple acts towards his guru from Srimad Bhagavatam, there's, there's no guru bhakti, it's not like chapter 6, guru bhakti. But here and there you'll find Krishna goes in the forest with his friend Sudama. We find the effect of insulting Guru when uh, Indra he disregards Brihaspati. We find a case of Guru being rejected in the case of Bali Maharaj. We find Guru's listening to their disciples' explanations 
in the case of Narada and Vyas, listening to Shukadev. But it's not systematic. Why is that? Well, one reason is that Srimad Bhagavatam, it's not taught, it's not, it's not like a book where in modern education they, they increasingly think, what's the use of teachers? You just you can just read the books. Everything is systematically set out in books. Knowledge is something that you, it's, it's a body of knowledge which is to be digested by the, by the mental functions. <laughs> But Vedic knowledge isn't like that. It's knowledge, it's to be understood through the intelligence, but through purified intelligence. And that's why again, sense control comes first. It's meant for character training, by which everything is revealed in the pure heart. That's why this, the mundane scholars, they may be more learned in Gorya Vaishnava philosophy than most of our devotees in ISKCON can ever hope to be. Some of them, they're very learned. But they never made any spiritual advancement because they never entered into the spirit of it. They never, they never made the steps of surrender. So they don't actually understand anything. Their understanding is completely superficial. Whereas someone who is not even very learned, who hasn't been to Srimad Bhagavat Vidya Pit, they may have so much realization and understanding and knowledge simply by hearing with a service attitude. They may not even be they may not even know how to read and write. Without akshara gyan, they have complete akshara gyan. Can you understand this? Akshara means writing. A to ksha in the Alphabet, what's that called? What's it? Hmm? What's it called in English? Alphabet. Yeah, alphabet. First letter is A and last is Ksha. So Akshara Gyan means to know how to read and write. So without knowing how to read and write, one can have complete Akshara Gyan. Akshara means Krishna. He's A ah is the beginning and Shat is the end. So he's everything, beginning, middle and end. So you can have complete knowledge without even reading and writing if one is blessed by Guru. That is the principle of Vedic education, completely different to modern education. Where there's no, there's no relationship between the teacher and the student. The teacher takes payment as soon as payment is involved, there cannot be any actual education. The, the, then it becomes uh, an exchange of money. It's, it's the, the teacher teaches out of affection for the student and out, just like one has to, in, in Karmakanda, one has to repay his debts to the pitris by how does one repay the debt to the pitri? By having sons. Everyone has to get married and have sons. <coughs> so there are different debts to be repaid. So one repays the debt to his guru for, for receiving knowledge by teaching others. It's a duty, it's dharma. One, if one has received knowledge, then it's his duty to teach others. So that is done without expectation of any mundane reward. And it's not that one has to we hear the same, make a living. How are you going to make a living? No one makes a living in Vedic culture. It is uh, dharma rakshati rakshita. One, one performs one's dharma, and then by the system of dharma, one is maintained. So the Brahmana teaches, and automatically he's maintained. That's all. Baba shaves, attends weddings, does his thing. 
He, no one pays him. Baba comes to your house, shaves, he's not paid. Washerman washes clothes, he's not paid. He never paid. The, the horseshoe is put on the horse, there's no payment. But the needs are covered. Rice is given, clothing is given, and so on. So it's a very different, un, completely different understanding and concept. The whole, the whole basis of modern education is that life is meant for enjoying the senses. Everyone has to look after themselves. You have to make it a um, teacher is a job. If you can't do anything well enough that you can get employed in it, then you teach it. That's the way it is. And he has no responsibility. Everyone is moving around all over the place. People don't stay in one place, so they never make strong relationships. The teacher is someone, they, they, once you leave school, finish. There's no more relationship. So I didn't get even begin to start answering any of these questions. Well, I did. Without looking at them. So, complete change of outlook is required. It's, it's a big job to establish this. The first thing that's required if we are to establish education is the actual education on the Vedic basis, and there's many things to do, is the uh, the understanding what is the purpose of education. Education is meant for self-realization, it's the ultimate goal. There may be, a, like I was saying, education, blacksmiths. They don't need to go to... Prabhupada had many... He said many things which in traditional societies were just accepted as normal. In modern society, they're, they're considered retrogressive. It means backward, moving backwards. They're not People think modern society, universal education, it's a good thing. But what is the value? We are turning out sub-animals. For all the education, the most popular on the internet, the most popular thing is pornography. So what is the use of such educating everyone means you're giving people without raising their consciousness and you're giving them access to all kinds of degrading materials. Now one point of Varnashram society, which is rarely discussed, even in Islam, is that traditional Varnashram society was ruled by kings. So, where's the king? In, in modern society, we have at least some some idea of what it means to be an intellectual. We have perverted intellectuals and we have some idea of what it means to be a Vaishya. Although the idea of what it means to be a Vaishya, the, the modern businessman is very different from the pious Vaishya like Nanda Maharaj. And Shudras we have, no, although they're impious Shudras. But, but we, we really don't have models of, of, on any level of what it means to be a Kshatriya. The modern leaders, they're not, they don't resemble in any way Kshatriyas. I've heard some devotees say that Bush is a Kshatriya because he sends troops to Iraq. That's not a Kshatriya. That's on the level of the street Gunda. <laughs> Uh, in the street, Gunda, I, I, he goes himself and fights. There's nothing brave about 
sitting in a conference and then deciding to send men to Iraq. Did he ever go there himself? I don't think so. I don't think so. Huh? He went a few times. I see. Yeah. Different to the Vedic Kshatriya who leads from the front. Bhima <laughs> is directly. Everyone can see he's protected by his strength. So they think he's a Kshatriya. Kshatriya means who protects from wrong elements. But these so these modern leaders, they're supposed to protect cows. Instead they're slaughtering them. They're supposed to oversee the structure of society by which women are protected. Instead, they think that this idea that women should have so-called equal opportunities with men, they think this is almost sacred. It's a principle of modern society that they should go out and mix up with all men and have abortions and not get married or get married and divorce six, seven times. They have no idea what it means to protect women. They're encouraging them to live in a way that they must be exploited. So we don't have a model of that. I heard it said, many years ago I heard it said that because India at that time had a woman prime minister, I heard it said that Prabhupada said that means there's no kshatri in the whole of India because they couldn't tolerate to be ruled by a woman. But this whole system of votes, it, it creates such, we can see in India, it creates such corruption in society. There's no, there's no real leader, there's no People have no idea what it means to, to have a, a king who is worshipable. Still that tendency is there. The king of Orissa, though he has no he has no authority of a king, but still the people of Orissa, they respect him entirely <coughs> also. The people, they respect the king so much. That tendency is there. Prabhupada said that still that tendency is there in India. The people they want they, they, to have a king. That's why they, they, the, con the only reason the Congress party keeps on coming to power in India is because of the Nehru Gandhi dynasty. And until Sonia Gandhi stepped forward to be the chairperson of the Congress party, it was considered to be finished. It just runs on the idea that it's a, a dynasty. I think most people think it's connected with Mahatma Gandhi which isn't true. But uh, Nehru, I think for the first 30 years from independence, I, I just got that article from it, the Congress party was in power. Because the people say, well then, Nehru, and then after that came his daughter, and then after that came her son, and now it's the son's wife, and it's... But, Somehow or other people relate to that, the dynastic system, even though they have no particular philosophy except Absarva, the Subhidavad, opportunism. But uh, people relate to that. This VP Singh, he was Prime Minister for some time. He was he was the Raja of somewhere, but he acted like such a clown that people couldn't respect him for that. Merapati Pagalhai came in the newspaper. His wife had once testified in court that her husband was insane. And VP Singh, the Prime Minister. Anyway. So, anyway, it's a big discussion. At least we should discuss so that we can start to put this. It's, it's going to be very difficult to press our Krishna consciousness movement forward 
as long as we're trying to run it on the template of the calm, crowed, lobe society, the two things don't mix. You can't have uh, TV and potato, potato crisps and modern education and Krishna consciousness. It doesn't work. The two things don't go together. It requires a different outlook on life and a different mode of life altogether. But we're very much stuck having been raised in this materialistic, demoniac society. We're very much stuck in that mode of thinking. Srila Prabhupada spoke very strongly against modern society. And we can still do. And the problems in society are they are compounded more than they are the, the inevitable course of society's demoniac endeavors is that it's becoming more and more complex and more and more degraded. But in one sense we can't speak we're not really in a position to speak so strongly because Iskon's 40 years old. Actually, it's 41 now, isn't it? So we haven't, in this time, we should have shown an alternative. So our failure, it's actually a failure to do so. Failure means it's not a complete failure. There's time to rectify. But it's really incumbent upon us to establish these communities by which we can show people and that it is possible to live in a different way. We don't, we're not bound to live by the factory consumer civilization. When it's not necessary. We don't have to live like that. People think that we have to live like that. Unless, unless we work in a factory or some office then how will we live? <coughs> so it's up to us to show that. I've said all these things many times. I think those who are my disciples might be bored by hearing this. Because I've said it many times. If we do make such communities, then many people will come, especially in the West, where many people, if they're, they're looking for an alternative, actually, they know. In India, if we say this, that this idea of progress, it's all rubbish, people, they know what you're talking about. Even our devotees, they, they think it's wonderful to get a good job and lots of money. But in the West, even non-devotees, if you say the society is sick, we need a complete, we need a different approach to life altogether. People know it. They may not be willing to listen to you even because they know it. They want to see, okay, what well, let's see it. If we show it, many people will be attracted to that. One devotee was telling about, the, I, I said this last time, a rainbow gathering in America. They have people who are in, have attraction for what they call alternative living. They gather, and our devotees go there every year and make, they, they always bring new devotees back to the temple. So I was telling him that. If we make these farm communities, we won't have to go out to these neo-hippies. They'll come to us. Prophet said people will join our farms in their millions. So, like I said, I've spoken on these things many times. I'll go on speaking about them. There's much more to be said. And ultimately, it's up to individuals to do it. You may ask, well, why don't I do it? Well, I am doing indirectly in as much as I try to you know, inspire people to do so. But uh, why don't I just go and stay on a farm 
I lived there. I could do, but considering the various services I had to do, that probably wouldn't be the most effective way to do it. Purusha Traiswami in Brazil, he made, made some farm project and he goes out and preaches also. And he says that people take it along. When you have something like that to show, an alternative way of living, then people take you much more seriously. What they call alternative living though, many times it's like they think how we can get alternative fuel to oil so that we don't depend upon these crazy Muslims as they think. Will be. So we should have some other kind of fuel. But they still think you're having the same way of life but with alternative fuel. But Prabhupada's idea wasn't that at all. There was an artificial petrol crisis, approximately 1975. So Prabhupada said, what is the solution to the petrol crisis? Don't use petrol. Then how do you go from one place to another? Prabhupada said, you walk, or if you need, you can have a bullock cart. What do you need to go? Why do you need to go from one side? People go, they go to a conference. They'll fly Bangalore to Delhi in the morning attend a conference and go fly back in the evening. Why do you need to travel 3,000 kilometers in one day? What's the need? There's no need. You don't need to travel. That's the solution to the petrol crisis. Prabhupada was telling one of his disciples to write a book, How to Solve All the World's Problems. And he was giving, they were asking the economic problem. Prabhupada was saying that you don't need money. The economic problem is solved by money. If you don't have money, then you don't have an economic problem. You don't need money. You need roti kapramakan, as they say in Hindi. Food, clothing and shelter. So everything's there on the land, you don't need money. That's for people who have more complicated lives, the Vaishyas and Kshatriyas. Otherwise, Shudras and Brahmanas, they don't have money. Money means gold. If there's gold, then the possibility to cheat is lessened. This, this whole modern economy, it's all based on artificial principles. The, the inflation, the taxes, it's all artificial. In Burma, when it was still called Burma, there was so much money was being uh, in, used for black money that overnight the government declared all the money the uh, invalid, all the bigger bills. And then they started having, instead of having 20 Kshat is the currency in Burma. They made, they made like 17 Kshat notes. All funny numbers. <laughs> so whatever, of course people in Burma, they never had the, the business. There's lots of money. There's lots of opium there. So there's lots of uh, illegal business. Lots of minerals being smuggled out of the country. Uh, mineral gems, gems. So that was their solution. In India too, some years ago, about 20 years ago, there was what, I think it was 1,000 rupees, no, you never saw them, they're only in black circulation. And the government declared that we're now going to take these out of circulation within seven days or something. So people didn't know what to do, because they couldn't just take them to the bank all their black money and so in this way they caught them. <laughs> he said, if you have these you can take it to the bank and then you can exchange it for smaller notes. You can't bring like, you know, one crore of notes because it's undeclared wealth. So they were caught. So like this, uh, producing paper money, it, it creates and then Inordinate taxes. It, we see in India there's so much 
the, the black or the the the, uh, the the undeclared economy is probably as big as the the black economy is this this uh, paper money and inordinate taxes it just produce it must create corruption just like if you want to sell a property sell land that's another bogus thing land should never be sold but then the stamp duty is so high the government requires so much that no one pays legal on paper no one pays more than half because that saves you paying so much money to the government so to avoid the taxes people deal in black money the rest is paid in secretly so all the, the, the all these economic problems and the whole the unemployment all these things it's all created by an artificial economy there are many many points that's enough for now any did i cover and uh, I was going to go through but can vanashram dharma based communities be established in our present modern society the answer is yes and no people say it's not possible to have vanashram communities in the modern age yes it is possible can it be established in our present modern society no has to be established to the side of separately from not exactly in it's the biggest revolution people people have no idea how great prophet said it his revolutionary is how revolutionary that we we t- we totally it's not capitalism or communism or fascism they're all based on the same principle of how to be, they're all based on the principle of how to organize society for forgetting Krishna for sense gratification properties and, and and then how what is it the utilitarian principle the, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people that should be the principle of organizing society jeremy bentham english economist utilitarianism Yeah, so their idea of happiness is that everyone, everyone should have the opportunity to earn as much money as possible and have as much freedom as possible to indulge their senses. This is American society. It's based on this principle, and there should be more and more facilities for sense enjoyment. Prabhupada gave the idea that no society should be based on we we don't need your money we don't need your TVs we don't need your electricity we don't need we don't want any of this we just want to live simply in chant Hare Krishna it's the biggest revolution no money no sense no artificial life we don't need all the things that people think they need we don't need electricity you can imagine how to live without electricity you live for, people live for hundreds of thousands of years you may think well it was so primitive and difficult but to get that electricity you have to go and do some ugra karmic job and you have to you know have big pylons all over the place and big power houses and dig up coal and make big furnaces and pollute the atmosphere and then you have to go to a job to get some money to pay for the electricity it seems like it's convenient but ultimately it's not to have the convenience of walking into the room and flicking on the switch to get a light you have to go to so much trouble but we don't see that so probably not have the greatest revolution in plans All right so anything else Yeah Well please mind it uh, please speak into the mic that um the about the external thing like what is the money and 
uh, rule and regulation and for what's it now the place we 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 heard that by following the devotional service, by performing devotional service, the all uh, good qualities will appear to in that in that person. So can you uh, explain a little bit? All the qualities develop in a person, but are you? Do you think that means that they don't? Because of that, they don't follow Varnashram principles. One of the good qualities is they do follow. What makes you think that having good qualities means they don't follow the Varnashram principles? I don't understand. What what, what is the insinuation here? that you don't need to follow Varnashram principles? Just by following Bhakti, you'll be good. So you don't need to follow Varnashram. Varnashram yeah, is for social organization and for regulating personal lives, for uh, interaction with others, and so that everyone can play their social role. Everyone has a social role. And there, there are many of the rules are for health and hygiene. It's just common sense. It's like brushing your teeth. It's for health and hygiene. Everyone should do it. That one should be a brahmachari, grihasta, vanaprasta, or a sannyasi. And there are certain rules to be followed within the ashram. It's not that because you're a Vaishnava, that you, uh, you're a Vaishnava, I'm a Vaishnava grihasta, therefore uh, I don't have to follow any rules of grihasta ashram. That's not true. We are, we are Vaishnavas, so we don't follow all these things. But why? I don't see that any of them. In fact, the, uh, why is it said that Shudras should not study Shastra? Because the, the Shudras they have less rules and regular. They're less regulated. They're at a lower level of consciousness, which is reflected in their uh, not following the Vedic rules and regulations. That's why I say, if you're actually a Vaishnava, then you can go above the rule of the Varnashram. But it's not that in the name of being. A Vaishnava, one acts below Varnashram principles. It's a very bad misunderstanding that devotees have that if you're a devotee, you don't need any Varnashram. But you have to follow some cultural guidelines. So if you don't follow that given in Shastra, then you follow that given by Hollywood, Bollywood. That's what you end up following, because you have to follow something. Man is a social animal. So the social animal means there are social norms that we adhere to. If we don't follow those given by Krishna and the Acharyas and all the generations of followers of the Vedic culture, then we follow that of the animalistic society. And it's not just the way we the whole way we think. Our whole attitude to life, the way we... That's why I see it's uh, in in Britain, America, Germany, the countries where the modern way of thinking is, is very strong. The idea of everyone, all people are equal in all respects. There's no, there's no culture of respect. Of course, people, they may deal with others in a superficially polite way, but there's no... Com- it's, it's allowed to... You'll find daily in the newspaper, of course, that's come in India now, they have cartoons lampooning the, the leader of the country. And that can't be in the Vedic culture, that the head of the country or the... Is, is made fun of. That's another result of democracy. You put a clown as the prime minister and people treat him as a clown. 
So, there's, so I find in these countries, just like we, we find here, that most of many of the students are coming from India, Eastern Europe. We have here one from Australia, one from Canada, one from Sweden, which is the, probably the most culturally degraded country in the world. <laughs> totally impersonal. The idea that so we don't find so many the, the principle of Guru Bhakti is very difficult for people in these countries to accept. Very difficult. And these are the countries where Ritvikism, if it has not so much in Germany, I don't, but definitely in England and America, that's where it, it's Protestantism. It's the same thing. There's the, there's the book, there's Jesus, the book, and me. There's no authority structure, there's no... Ch I just read. So it's like there's Prabhupada, I read his books, and that's it. I don't need anything else. Because they have no culture. Yeah. Please. I, another thing, I, I, there are so many things, I've said many of these things many times. So. But uh, I say our movement is concerned more with education nowadays. But I'm afraid that even though we're teaching Prabhupada's books, but if we're teaching it through the mindset and the systems and being enamored by modern education, then it's not going to come through the same way. Inst instead of studying modern educational systems, why don't we study Vedic educational systems? Why are we so enamored by you know all this PhD, MSc nonsense? The uh, there, there's no in Vedic education you don't get a certificate when you leave. Your certificate is your yagya pavitra. That's it. Uh, that you that you that's it. You you have this. That means you don't just take it, but that means you take and you study. Acharya Bhagavan Purusha Veda. The fact that you've studied with an acharya, that you've been accepted by an acharya, and that you spend time with him and you studied with him, that in itself is your certificate, and your character is your certificate. You don't need any piece of paper. Hmm. In 1974, Sri Prabhupada gave extensive talks about his disciples in Vrindavan, known as Varnashan talks, and he was talking extensively and in details about um, establishing Varnashan colleges. And I was studying those conversations and found interesting. I just want to ask you about how to combine these two statements of Prabhupada together. On one hand, he was literally imploring his disciples to show a proper example to people as far as Varnashan Dharma, teaching them, even inviting people who are not devotees to study and learn how to become proper human beings in different categories, churches, vices, etc. But then on the other hand, he would also as repeatedly tell them and remind them, remind them not to consider Vaishnavas to be belonging to any of those categories, not even Brahmanas. So as what he said, never think yourself, never think Vaishnavas to be Brahmanas, never think yourself to be Brahmanas, just mm -hmm. Vaishnavas. Just step down and teach people how to behave properly in yeah. these categories and then step up again. So how do we, uh, in a practical way, combine these two things in our well, a devotee, as Prabhupada said, that a devotee may act as a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, to teach others. But, it, but it's just like the, the teacher teaches A, B, C. But he knows that my, my identity is Gopi Bhartha, Padakamalaya, Dasa, Dasa, Dasa. He doesn't identify with the body, but for the sake of uh, but for the sake of showing people how to live, they may take that wrong. That's all. And it's pretty. I mean, Prabhupada said this again and again, and devotees were asking again and again. And it seemed to be Prabhupada seemed to be wonder, wondering why the devotees couldn't catch this simple point. 
must have the purpose because uh, as you have uh, very uh, nicely described the uh, nature of heaven on the one side still in clear and kind of unmashed down by saying so for external people and where just the but on the other hand we also have people in Russia who tried hard to establish our passion they understood it by imposing those designations on devotees based on their maybe some predispositions towards particular kind of activity and they started classifying people in a Where was that? Uh, one one systematic systematic attempt was one that was being confirmed. No, it's a permanent system. Yeah, but where? Yeah. In the temple? Yeah. And then also in around the community, around the temple community. And uh, some individual attempts are being made in Moscow and have extensive debates with some people who try to just classify everyone according to But I don't think, how are you going to do it unless you have your own community? That's one of the points, yeah. How, how can you do it if someone's, you know, working as a truck driver or something and then... You have to have your own community. Well, they say, for instance, I don't know if you want me to give an example of their argumentation to take us to this particular mm. gathering or not. But for instance, they say, look at the example president, he's supposed to be Kshatriya, and Kshatriya is going to get like remunerations for their services, assistance, whatever, he has to collect taxes or do some work, otherwise he is not fit to be a temple president. He has to, or he has to be Brahmin for the nation, see what he is a temple man. He's everything. He's Kshatriya, Brahmana, Vaishya, Shudra, whatever is needed. <laughs> Teaches the class, he's a Brahmin. Worships the deity, he's a Brahmin. Kshatri, he had ministry. And then Vaisha, he may also have to do the fundraising. If no one else is there, he'll take out the garbage also. So he's. One thing, it's not that one can be an administrator and a Brahmin also. For, for administrating the mud, the Brahminas do that. Not Kshatri. <coughs> There's an administration, Kshatriya administration means on the executive level, but even within each family, the, the, the woman is the, she administers the home, there's some kind of management system, so wherever, there are subsystems of management, so the mud is managed by Brahmanas, the, among the Vaishya community, we find Nanda Maharaj. He wasn't a Kshatri. He was a Vaishya. But he, he was directing a section of society. So it requires a, it requires a lot of study and prayer. And uh, Understanding. Vidya Purna Maharaj, he's done a lot of study of Vedic education and Dharmashram. So why don't we learn from him? Once in Mayapur, one devotee connected with MIAG asked me if I had like, any advice. I said, Why are you asking me? Why don't you go over there? Ask Vidya Purna Maharaj. He studied so much all these things. Hmm. Oh, one thing I said to him also that uh, you know, there are certain controversial points within Prabhupada's books, and unless we are prepared to tackle these and give a siddhanta on them. That's what I said to them. By, by what they do they, they, in the MIAG, so I'm told, and I, I said to this devotee who asked me, by discussing it among all the different students and without giving any siddhanta, because you want to avoid controversy, then you're actually introducing relativism, that any opinion is as good as any other. And you're actually, in the name of teaching Prabhupada's books, you're introducing Mayabha. Because any, this is a difficult point, we don't understand it, your opinion is as good as mine, and then what's, and then why then, what's the value of why study Prabhupada's books at all? What's the Siddhanta? We should understand. 
But many of the things Prabhupada stated are socially what is called not politically correct. So, these are some of the dangers of not going in with the attitude of Sarvami Tatvitam Manye Yangman Vadasi Keshava. Unless we are prepared to accept Guru Mukha Padma Bhakya Chite Te Harmonist. That's the things that may instead when we read things or we come across things in Shastra or in, or in Guru Vani that we don't understand or we find difficult to accept, instead of just trying to pretend it doesn't exist or say, well, this explain it away by saying, well, that's some time ago. That was for 1975 and now uh, everyone in history in the Vedic tradition up to 1975 understood it in this way, but now the world has changed since that time. And so that was time, place and circumstance, so it's all different. Instead of trying to explain it away, we should uh, try to understand understand it as the Acharyas presented to us, not as we think they should present it to us. They may not fit to be a disciple. If we don't understand, then we should inquire and try to understand. The great example is there in Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna is explaining, I heard all this, I spoke this to Vivaswan, and then this knowledge came down through Parampara, and then and Arjuna interrupts and said, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? that uh, you're just the same age as me, then how... How did you speak to Vivaswan? Years, you know, Vivaswan, and then he, he spoke to Ichvaku, and then Manu, and then how is that possible? This was a long time ago. How is that possible? He didn't say, hey, you're a crackpot. What are you talking about? This is nonsense. This doesn't make any sense. How could you have spoken to you? You're just talking rubbish. No, he said, Katame how, can, how am I to understand this? He understood that it seemed impossible to him, but he understood that Krishna is on a higher platform of knowledge. Krishna understands things that I don't understand. So what seems to me impossible, I'm going to ask Krishna to explain it to me. And Krishna did. He explained that, yeah, I, I already explained that we all have many births, but I remember and you don't. And then the whole thing, Ajopi, Sanamayama, he explained. So instead of thinking that, well, Prabhupada made this mistake, or Shastra, this doesn't apply, Varnashram doesn't apply, although Prabhupada clearly said that it's, we should introduce this. And we should find out the ways and means to apply it, rather than writing it up. There's another theory which is actually accepted by the GBC, although it's rubbish, sorry to say. I don't like to... I mean, we shouldn't criticize the GBC, we should follow authority, but in this respect, they made a big mistake by saying that there's, they, they, there was a woman's ministry paper in which they said that there's tradition, there's Asura Varnashram and then there's Daivi Varnashram and Prabhupada introduced a new kind of Varnashram. That's what they said. And then, according to them, all the old rules of Varnashram don't apply anymore. So, sorry, it's rubbish. It's because Prabhupada in the beginning didn't insist on all the rules of Varnashram. The men and women used to all mix up because they were hippies and Prabhupada didn't try to convert them from being not hippies. And uh, immediately. But then as Prabhupada, as Prabhupada saw that his disciples, they were not 
Prabhupada is giving them the highest principles of Krishna consciousness. We saw that many of them couldn't even follow the basic rules of human life. Then he wanted to introduce Varnashram. And then gradually there were things introduced like men and women stand in different parts of the temple and brahmacharis don't mix up with women and there is some rules are introduced but that was interpreted by some that this was actually Prabhupada didn't introduce all these things it was introduced by some of his nasty sannyasis and uh, actually Prabhupada wanted that we have a new system of Varnasha in which the men and women all mix up like cats and dogs like they do in American society and that's what that's Prabhupada's Varnasha and the, the, the GBC accepted this paper, the principles of this paper, and anyway, it's a long history. A new kind of Varnashram, Prabhupada introduced, it's a speculation. Yeah, very serious mistakes are being made. I have a question regarding this point that you just made. Um, I know there's statements in Prabhupada, and whatever most statement I think is this kind of thing. The whole, this whole world of civilization is chaotic because of the unrestricted mixture of man and woman. He, he made statements like that, yeah. yeah. But, but the, in the first case. In, in one. Uh, in one famous interview, there was a feminist TV reporter, and then at the end, Prabhupada was saying that women are less intelligent than men, they should be submissive to their husbands, and then she said sarcastically, that so according to you, the whole, all the problems in society are caused because women are not submissive to men. Prabhupada said, yes. Heavy statement. The modern mythology is that men and women should mix freely and they're all the same and women, the whole history of the, the human civilization is one of suppression of women. So, well in one sense it's true. It is a history of suppression of women. Because unless women are protected and controlled then there's chaos in society. And that's true of the present time. Another thing is that if women have been exploited throughout history, it just shows how they're less intelligent. It proves the point, doesn't it? They only woke up to it now. And yeah. I was going to bring another quote of Prabhupada that in the first canto um, in chapter 18 when he uh, when Krakshit counter uh, chastises Kali then Prabhupada gives some practical points that can be implemented there's no how much there's co-education is that yeah, one you wanted to bring up? but if they're attractive they should get married yeah yeah so, you, are, you want me to comment on that? Well, I see that as an, as an, maybe some interim stage, because later Prabhupada said that he wanted the daughters of his disciples, they should learn, they should not go to school. Now, who's teaching that nowadays? You ever heard that? They don't teach them, but that's clearly what Prabhupada said. He said they should learn how to said they should learn two things, how to cook very nicely and how to be very chaste. And these are the two main things. That, and they can learn to read and write so they can read my books. That can be their education. And even for education in his Guru Kul, Prabhupada wanted the main thing they learn is how to be devotees. They should, Prabhupada's book should be the curriculum. But Prabhupada, he wasn't... Uh, women's education and also um, 
universal education, Prabhupada wasn't in favor of that. Now you may think that, well, then women don't get any education. They, they, they do the Brahmana woman. What happens is, the Brahmachari, when he goes home and gets married, he's the guru of his wife. That doesn't mean he just bosses her around, but he has to actually teach her what he learned. What he learned, the essence of it, he has to teach to his wife. That's why a Brahmin, a woman, will be also, they also know. Kapila did tell his mother. So it's not, that they, it's not that they're uneducated, but they don't go to school. They get their education at home, home education. Hmm. Now, many times when I say all these things, devotees say this is just Bhaktivika Swami's craziness or something like this. Just something I say. So I invite you, please look at Prabhupada's books. See his conversation, see what he says. Many devotees don't know the things that Prabhupada, you, you didn't know, you were raised in this country, you didn't know that Prabhupada said that the daughters of his disciples, they shouldn't go to school, they should be educated in the home. First time you've heard it, just see. These things are being suppressed. Well, there's a task, who wants to find it? It must be in the conversations. Hmm? Letters also. Yeah. It's. I claim that it's not my craziness. If you want to blame anyone for being crazy, blame Prabhupada. If you can't blame him, then you get in trouble. There are many things. Even some things that Prabhupada said, we. Privately, we can't say them publicly, even among devotees. Some things, because if they're circulated, then it's too dangerous to circulate. Some of the things Prabhupada said. Now you're really wondering what kind of words. <laughs> I'll leave you with the one about girls not being educated. That's enough to get our movement closed down, probably, in the Western world, if we try to implement that. Yeah. You going to who's that? Oh, should we finish that? Yeah. I have a, a small point here. That was one last one small point that you, you mentioned before. Regarding the crisis by Petros. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, in order to solve this problem, I guess, uh, you know, don't, don't use Petros. I remember one day, here in the school, they were discussing if we didn't use petrol and, and how we will be traveled. For example, our devotees are in Western countries, they want to come to Brindavan. Yeah, all right, we can keep the planes for devotees to come to Brindavan. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no need. And it may be that uh, actually, if you say you're living in South America or whatever, you may not come to India. And you can make Vrindavan there. You can make the same atmosphere. Mm. Um, this recently we were listening to a lecture of Paul Pan, as she was on the uh, one five three six. You remember very right. well. Um, and Prabhupada was explaining. That well, that only gives me some vague idea. And then we turn about Narad. Yes. I don't know exactly. To the essence, it's the first that one should uh, that activities in this world that are done to the set activities in this world that are done to the satisfaction of the Lord is bhakti yoga. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Anyway, and and then Prabhupada explains that there's uh, vedika and logika karma, 
and both uh, can be spiritualized. And then it said, uh, like, should, I mean, it didn't, it didn't want to, uh, into, I mean, it, it could be explained like that, but from what I understood is that he said, um, so he said agriculture, but then he started explaining how, uh, I mean, he said agriculture, so I understood, okay, that's the traditional way of, of uh, low pika duties. You maintain yourself through agriculture. But no, actually, you don't maintain yourself through agriculture. Just see how we, our way of thinking. It's performed as a duty. The Vaishya produces grains and protects the cows, keeps some for himself and distributes to others. The Vaishya is the stomach of society. You're not working for yourself. The Vaishya, everyone works for the, his social role is to benefit others. Just see the consciousness embedded in our very way of speaking. Vaisha produces grains not only for himself, but for the whole society. And then they distribute and they pay taxes in grains and ghee. Nanda Maharaj, he took milk products to Kamsa. This way he was paying his taxes. Good citizen. So, and then that's used for yagya. It's all the cycle. Anad bhavanti bhutani parajanya adam samaha. Yagya bhavati parajanya, yagya karma samadhava. So everyone performs their swakarma. And then the, the Lord blesses, rains come, and then there's a cycle. So it's not that you're just working for a living, but everyone has an interacting social role, that everyone performs their dharma, and the result is offered to Vishnu, literally, in yagya. It's a whole completely different way of, completely different outlook. Uh, you don't work for a living. You don't work for a living. We perform our swakarma as a duty. And that automatically our living is supplied. You don't have to think how I'm going to survive. It's automatically there. It's a completely different way, completely different outlook. And then I want to explain that uh, now this Lokika duty is, in my civilization, is industry. Yeah, like factories. And it said, so this is good, this is very good. Uh, we don't actually do stop, just uh, do it for Krishna. Sometimes he said like that, yeah. And um, there's one book. <coughs> What's that called? That's called Karma Yoga. One of Prabhupada's earlier writings, he was saying how we can spiritualize the factories. No, not the sort of knowledge. It's published as a small book. I, can't, I just can't remember the title now. It's not been very widely circulated. So Prabhupada was doing this somewhere. He, at one point he was suggesting that went to the factory, distribute prasad, and then they should have kirtan in the factories. Yeah. But that's, again, I see this as an interim measure, because Prabhupada said, ultimately, there's no need for factories. Factories are dungeons for demons, Prabhupada. Ugra karma. So there may be some interim level also. Or maybe both things will go on side by side. Those who live, they'll live simply and others who are addicted to the modern way of life, they can do that and chant Hare Krishna also. 
Yeah, there are cities also, but it's an agricultural based society. There are cities, yeah. And with the cities, it's just like we have in in the old European culture what are called market towns, in which they the people from the village come and bring produce and they, they can purchase things which Purchase means they'll be by barter or by gold or cowries or something. Things which are not producible in the villages. And city also, like Prabhupada is saying from Mayapur city, maximum population 50,000. So these, when we, when we think of city nowadays, we think of how many, how many millions but not more than 50,000. They serve, they, they interact with the village economically. Did the prophet have from vision for other like townships or cities apart from Mayapur? Um, Was he promoting that? Not that I know of. No. He didn't say they couldn't be. Naturally, if, there, if there's agricultural basis, so there will be towns also. But for those who are in town life, the thought of living on the land seems to be the most frightening thing. It is difficult in some ways physically, but it's much easier mentally. When you're no longer, if you're away from the modern, the, all the stress and the, the of, of modern life and the uh, the, the constant pushings of, of lust and greed which epitomize modern life. You're away from that. It's just so sweet. So it's just so easy on the mind. <laughs> 